Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and we will start now. So welcome to this afternoon's um, Tech Talk by ABB and Captimize on carbon capture and storage. My name's Alan D'Ambrosio. I'm the Market Development Manager for ABB Consulting Services, and I'll take you through the introduction for this and hand over to Martin Roden. I'll introduce Martin in uh, two or three slides time, uh, who will take us through carbon capture and storage. Okay, so for those who have been on AB uh, webinars before, uh, everyone's on mute. So um, if you submit any questions, please do that all the way through on the Q&A box. So you'll see that um, in the software in there. So you're all on mute. The event is being recorded, so hopefully that's okay. But it also enables us to share the event uh, after this event as well. Okay, the agenda this afternoon, we're going to go through a short introduction. I'll talk to you about the ABB Captimized relationship and you know the purpose of that relationship and how that's going to benefit uh, customers in the in the UK and customers around carbon cap uh, around carbon capture schemes and energy transition as well. In there. Then we're gonna I'll hand across to Martin Roden. Martin will take you through an overview of who Captimize are background himself and then he'll take us through a case study of a real CCS project that uh, Captimizer are working on. We'll talk about the opportunities and challenges around CCS for emitters and operators in there and then we'll finish off with questions. Why is carbon capture necessary? You know we're seeing governments across the world um, looking at how we save our planet how we decarbonize our industrial base. So it's a challenge across the world. Um, the world has survived on methane, it's survived on emitting vast quantities of CO2 uh, through the industrial revolution. And this is all about how we actually transition into that. So, you know, to reduce the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, to get to net zero, you know, part of the solution will be some sort of carbon capture scheme in there, but there are other solutions and we'll talk about those as well. Um, so uh, in the UK, the UK government introduced a carbon cluster strategy in there. So I'll talk about one of the projects ABB is involved in around that carbon cap uh, clusters in there. And biomass policy statement came out as well in November 2021. And we saw a lot of commitments uh, around COP26 as well, uh, which seems a long time ago. You know, since then, we've seen big challenges around energy security, and we've seen, unfortunately, some reversal around the sort of uh, commitments that were made at COP26. So, and again, we'll cover some of those during the webinar this afternoon. I'd just like to talk first about a project that ABB is involved in. So, as ABB, you know, we're we're in the northeast and northwest of England. We our heritage is in petrochemicals, but we're involved in the Northern Endurance Partnership, uh, providing a known as engineer for an element of that project in uh, looking at both the hydrogen and carbon dioxide backbone to, uh, to that project, to the transportation and compression in there. Uh, so from ABB's perspective, that's great because that puts us at, at the heart of energy transition, puts us at the heart of the the energy cluster in there, but it also supports a lot of what we're going to talk about today around the carbon capture schemes, because this is about building the infrastructure. Today, we're really going to be talking about how we can support the industrialists and the emitters of CO2 and transition either through some sort of carbon capture scheme or through fuel switching and energy efficiency improvements in there. But that, this is a live project we're working on and the project in feed and this will carry on. Uh, through into 2023. So we'll start with a poll question though. Um, you know, carbon capture isn't the only way to decarbonize. So there are many ways to decarbonize our industry. Uh, below are some of the options available to us. From you, in your organizations, which of these are your the preferred strategy for your organization? So th there's a few choices you can pick on. Improving energy efficiency, so A will be the improving the energy efficiency of your operation. B will be the carbon capture and storage. C will be carbon capture and utilization instead of storage. D is fuel switching, looking for different sources other than methane in there. And E, unfortunately, is you know 
shutting down a facility. Um, so you'll see the poll question on the screen. If you can select uh, your preferred option, uh, we'll leave this poll open for 30 seconds and then we'll look at the, uh, the results from it. So again, A is improving the energy efficiency of our operation. B is carbon capture and storage. C is carbon capture and utilization. D is uh, fuel switching and E is shutting down a facility. Results have just come in. So really intriguing. 50% of respondees actually are looking at just improving energy efficiency of our operation. And that's great. That's obviously the lowest cost. It's the things we can do Im immediately and it will um, decarbonize our facilities. I don't think it'll get us to net zero though, but it will do. 18% are looking at carbon capture and storage. 11% are looking at carbon capture and utilization. Surprisingly, only 16% are looking at fuel switching because I thought that would be a much higher number than 16%. So yeah, for all these hydrogen plants being built, only 16% are looking at utilizing those. And 5%, which is fortunately a very low number, are looking at shutting down a facility. But we have seen a lot of that happen. Okay, I think the last slide for me before I hand over to Martin Rodin. So ABB were introduced to Captimize at the start of this year. Captimize is specialist in, in carbon cap, uh, capture and utilization and storage. That's their core business. They've been doing it for the, the consultants and advisors in CCS have been doing it for 10 to 15 years. Um, they're able to analyze all elements of the process and do feasibility studies. And what we actually saw was a great opportunity of, of bringing AB's customer base, AB's knowledge of existing operations and captimizers, depth and specialism in carbon capture and storage together to be able to take to industrialists and CO2 emitters in the UK, really to be able to offer a, a strong proposition to help people decarbonize. So that's why we formed a relationship so there's a, a collaboration agreement that was signed between the two parties in there. And at the moment, we're working, looking at opportunities with uh, customers around doing that. So that's what we formed in the collaboration agreement. So that's my last slide. So with that, I'll introduce Martin Roden. So Martin is the co-founder of Captimize. Martin will give an introduction to himself and he'll also get an introduction to Captimize and then take us through the rest of the presentation. Across to yourself, Martin. Unmute, unmute. Thank you very much, Alan. And hello, everybody. Well, I'm uh, Martin Roden, as Alan said. I've been working uh, over 15 years with the carbon capture and storage, or CCS, as we usually say. Uh, actually, we, we worked in the US and Europe, basically, uh, in parallel for these 15 years. And we were initially uh, four people that came from different companies. We were all competitors and we worked with four different technologies or actually five different technologies. And we decided to, instead of selling technology, we will actually explain how, C how, how CCS works for, uh, for the emitters. So we changed uh, position to be uh, an independent specialist instead of selling technology. And uh, so we were initially four uh, specialists, and now we are 20. And we are then a, uh, a specialist team, and we are then advising emitters how to go about with CCS and how to find a way in this jungle. So basically, we are sorting, uh, supporting the emitters, and we are completely technology independent. So we are really independent, and that's kind of a, a really important thing for us. Uh, and. Uh, our, our mission is actually to cut the cost of CCS. We've heard so many years that CCS is very expensive. We know that it doesn't have to be very expensive uh, and we know how to find a way of reducing the cost. Because cutting cost in CCS is extremely important because in the end, somebody has to pay for it and it will be polluters pay or it will be uh, someone within your company that will actually have a margin on CO2 or so. So cutting the cost of capturing is, or the whole chain is very important. So uh, who is Captimize? Well, we are a specialist in CCS. We do two things. We actually uh, do pre-feasibility studies 
and we do uh, we actually deliver demonstration units so the pre-feasibility studies i will tell you a little bit more in that in a minute and demonstration unit is actually a two uh, container solution one ton per day actually that we deliver out to emitters sites it's actually a physical a physical unit and um, and it's very uh, appreciated and uh, we can leave it there for six months or two years or something like that and i'll tell you more about that in a minute as well but we work in the early stages so we actually help help emitters to actually go from zero to one uh, and then uh, avb and other uh, can can then come in and take over and help do the rest but we don't deliver anything we actually just increase the knowledge from zero to one uh, that's our initial goal so next slide please alan so uh, our team has the last 10 years actually made 30 full-scale pre-feasibility studies in germany uk nordics and the usa it's been energy from waste plants bioenergy plants power plant gas fired power plants uh, coal fired power plants process plants uh, like uh, steam methane reformers cement plants and so on and basically any plant that emits co2 so why why would you like to make a study why not just you know order a system well basically you do the study to reduce the cost if you don't do the study you will pay you could pay basically twice as much as if you do the study before so um, uh, so what is uh, the purpose well the purpose is to understand the options of the feasibility because it is feasible we know that it is feasible but it's feasible in different way so we actually look at the, all the options of technology and the process there are many processes and many technologies and we provide you the the options that you have and the cost so the cost of each each option and why the cost uh, is uh, different from different options so the drivers of the cost is very important to understand because you can affect that yourself so and then uh, we have another thing which is very important that's uh, you, you you want to avoid contractual issues with the suppliers some of these suppliers that in CCS are huge companies. I mean, you know, I'm, you are, um, emitters are very small and these companies are huge. And you don't want to get into a contractual issue very early with these companies. So actually you want to understand much, much more before you engage with direct contact with the suppliers. And you also want to make a smooth purchase process because in the end, you may want to, you know, put this out for bidding and then you don't want to be stuck with a supplier too early in the process. So you want to have a smooth purchase process and you want to go about this, pro this, this kind of understanding first pre-feasibility, pre-feasibility, pre-feed, feed study in a, in a smooth way. And uh, we can help you with that together with ABB. So uh, next slide, please. So uh, a little bit of our history then. We, you know, as I said, we are a team. Uh, some of us are pretty old. Uh, I mean, Ola has been working, he is 68, 67 years now. He is the one that has built, Ola Augustan has done a lot of research papers. He has been the person who has built most of the CCS plants in the whole world. So basically he's in the team. And so actually we built 13 different demonstration plants in different formats within the team. It's been hot potassium carbonate, chilled ammonia, uh, uh, amines, and chilled ammonia again, and the oxyfuel, calcium looping, hot potassium carbonate. I'll leave you this, this, this uh, slide so you can have a look. But basically, we've been building plants, smaller plants, not full uh, scale plants, but smaller plants around the world the last 15 years. and. Uh, just for your information that there is actually n only a few uh, real full size full scale plants for on flu gases in the world so all these demonstration plants are really important to understand how it works all right so next slide please 
Uh, all right. So if you click a little bit more, we will see the other the other uh, small uh, uh, things coming up there. Yeah. All right. Great. So basically, uh, if you go back one, here you go. So basically, what is carbon capture? Well, it's actually carbon capture and storage is a long, complex chain and business case. It's not each part of the chain is fairly uh, straightforward, fa fairly simple, but the problem is the complexity of the total chain. And you will understand that as soon as you get into this, that it's not actually the capture, which is a problem. It's the full chain, which is the problem, because you have to understand the full chain to understand uh, the cost uh, of the total cost. And it's the co the total cost that will actually be uh, the cost you have to calculate with. And uh, as an emitter, you are actually responsible for all your molecules from the starting point until the permanent storage. So you have to make sure, sure that your molecules are actually stored. So it is actually a technology issue about carbon capture, but it's also a technology issue about liquefaction the buffer storage, should it be bullet storage or spherical? How are you going to get the CO2 from your site to the harbor? That may be the pipeline for many people close to the clusters in the U in the UK, but it, it may be also so that you're far away from the cluster and you need to tra transport your CO2 with a train. We're actually right, you know, right now we are working on exactly like that, uh, that uh, case in, in, in the UK. And uh, it could be with truck as well. So uh, in the harbor, you may uh, transport it via, via pipeline to the storage, as in many of the clusters, but it may also be with a ship. And then you actually have to make sure that it's actually stored uh, where it is supposed to store. And in the UK, you have also a few clusters which are storing, but you make, have to make sure that your molecules are stored. And all this is a lot of contractual stuff. It's a lot of understanding. Uh, of the whole chain before you actually know the cost, the, per, the, the, the total cost for you, which is what you will actually uh, have to deal with, with your investors. All right, next slide, please. So uh, the low cost is critical uh, for CCS uh, and someone has to pay. We are going into a scenario where you're talking about polluters pay. And uh, that's kind of maybe a little bit further down the line, but the first the first years now, there will be investors who is paying, there will be grants who is paying. But in the end, within fairly short time, it will be, uh, we will end up in a polluters pay situation. And uh, then you have to know exactly what cost and you have to know exactly how to calculate the cost and how to cut the cost. And then you have to understand the full chain. Like I just show you, you have to understand the full chain. It's very important. And you also have to define fairly early in your studies, the key performance indicators. And that's actually why, why are you doing this? Uh, and what is important to you in this? Are you looking at, you know, uh, novel technologies that will be good for the future? Or are you doing something that you need to have TRL 9? Or uh, is it environmental uh, technology? Or is it something else? And uh, where, where do you want it to go do with your, uh, with your uh, CO2? Will you actually store it or will you actually use it? And all those things are things that you need to look at before you start uh, the feasibility study or you have to put them as part of your feasibility study. So, you know, knowing why and the key performance indicators actually framing that why is very important. The second, th the third thing is the capture technologies. There are uh, 30 tech capture technologies out there and you have to look at many because jumping to conclusions to go to one technology because the big companies are using the that technology is not the way to do. You have to look at many technologies and look at their TRLs and look at where what are the headaches with some technologies and what are uh, the upside the upsides and downsides of each technology. Very important. You have to check at least 
three technologies to be to, to be sure that you're doing the right thing. We usually check between three and five technologies for the emitters and we compare the cost. We do heat and mass balances of, of, of the whole plant. Then uh, contractual. You don't want to end up, as I said, we don't sign a lot of NDAs with suppliers. It will be very difficult to get out of it if you signed an NDA with, with one A mine suppliers. Uh, they will show you stuff that you can't basically transmit to the other one that you will buy in the end. So uh, if you're using if you're choosing A mines, so basically be very careful of signing NDAs. So learn a lot more before you sign any NDA with a supplier. Do that when you know much more. And then you have to look at a purchase strategy. It's it's um, you can do a lot of different strategies, and you have to do uh, you have to see how you're going to do the EPC or EPCM. Are you going to do a pre-feed and a feed? Are you going to do two pre-feeds and one feed? All this stuff is very important when you when you go forward. So the first part we do is actually do we do a, a pre-feasibility study. And in the end of the pre-feasibility study, we usually uh, discuss the purchasing strategy with the emitters to guide them, you know, the, the, the best way forward for their company to do, to do what they want to do. So these are the five key points in order to cut the cost of a carbon capture and storage uh, facility. All right. Next slide, please. So uh, when you do a feasibility study or a pre-feasibility study, you start doing a technology screening study to the left. And you look at between three and, and, and five technologies to see, and you actually integrate those virtually into your plant. So you do heat and mass balance of each of the technology. You look at the energy consumption of steam, electricity, and other things. You look how to integrate them within your within your company, within your plant, if you can reuse heat, if you can reuse anything else in, in the, in when you add this extra uh, plant, it's actually, you're going to add a chemical plant to your plant. So that's what you're going to do. And you have to understand that. Um, and the second thing is not to do the pre-feasibility study. The second thing is actually to look at the utilization or the transport and storage, because um, when you do that, it will have an impact on your plant. If you're going to send out the CO2 by train or by pipeline or by by gas, because you're going to use it in a in a fuel plant, then it actually have an, has an impact on your actually your actual site. So you do first the technology screening, then you do the utilization, transport, or storage study. Then you go to the middle part and do the pre-feasibility study where you start looking at, you know, the costs um, on, a, on, a, on a global scale and you start looking at the income because the income is also very important. If you're doing CCU, you're going to sell fuel uh, by, you know, probably, uh, or you've got to do something else. If you do in CCS, you will, and you have negative emissions, you want to sell uh, carbon removal credits or you will actually avoid um, avoid uh, ETS um, ETS grants or ETS uh, credits. So all this stuff. So you need to do all the three ones. But you start with the left one, then you take the right one, and then you do the middle one. And then then you do these actually uh, according to difference. You start with class five or class four in ACE. I mean, it's the number of uh, uncertainty of the cost. Then you go to you reduce the cost once you get further down the line with the studies. All right, next slide, please. Yes, now right. it's your turn. Okay, uh, give Martin a break. So poll question number two. Um, are, you, are you or your organizations confident on the success of the UK government and the base strategy for net zero? So there's a, there's a few potential answers on this. So. Option A is yes, and you've applied for base or cluster funding as part of uh, the funding rounds that have come round. Yes, but you're waiting for the outcome from other companies, seeing who's successful. So you, you're not going to be a first mover. C would be no. There's been insufficient engagement from uh, base or uh, 
from the infrastructure companies. Um, no, the funding's insufficient for your company at the moment. You know, you, the funding is low. I was at a conference yesterday and they, they were talking about the funding being dismal. And the last one is don't know. So we'll just look, leave that running for 30 seconds as before. And then we'll share the answers to that. So we obviously noticed that there's quite a lot of companies as ABB, we're working on the Northern Endurance. So we know quite a few companies have applied, but the majority haven't yet. Okay, so yeah. Okay, so um, I'll start with the, the bottom one. Don't know is 49%. So um, a lot of you don't know where, where uh, your organizations are for applying for funding. 19% of people have applied for base funding. 11% uh, yes, but they're waiting for the outcome from other companies. And 22%, which is a, uh, almost a quarter of the people on here, there's been insufficient engagement uh, in there. And obviously, there's been a lot of things going on. Um, and uh, Zero has said the funding is too low. So, okay. All right. With that, Martin, I'll hand back to yourself and we'll go through the first case study. Back to you, Martin. All right. Uh, so, um, actually, uh, we did, we, we've been working with uh, Stockholm Exergy, which is a biomass plant. Uh, they are actually. Um, it's a pure biomass plant. It's a district heating plant provides most. It's the biggest district heating plant in Stockholm. There are at least seven different plants, but this is the biggest one. And uh, we are going to capture 800,000 tons per year. And uh, it's interesting because Stockholm will, uh, by definition, become carbon negative with that. They uh, have 400. Uh, it will actually double the emissions of four of, of the cars. Uh, uh, and, and actually, it's, it, it's a very, so Stockholm by 2026 will be carbon negative city. So the, 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 the city has been very driving here. So we started 2018, we did a technology screening study. And then we continued with a pre-feasibility study. And in the technology screening study, we actually looked at 35 different technologies and we analyzed them. We put up the KPIs for Stockholm Exergy and then we did the pre-feasibility study with two, two technologies. And then we did a feasibility study with one technology. And, uh, and basically, we then we supported with the application of the European Innovation Fund 2020. And uh, uh, they actually got it 2021. Uh, they got, no, 2022, they got uh, the money, 1.8, uh, 180, uh, 180 million euros they got from the EU Innovation Fund. They were one of seven who got the first round. We put up this demonstration unit, as you can see on the bottom uh, there, uh, 2019. We have upgraded it. Uh, twice and uh, now you can see the little slipstream there from the flue gas. Here's the flue glass pipe. You see the two uh, slipstreams uh, from the flue gas type uh, pipe going into the into the demonstration unit. Stockholm Exergy uh, claims that it's the most visited uh, container in the world, and and they have basically visitors every day, all year round to to actually look at this the capture unit and to see that it works. It actually has been working, uh, uh, has been working all the time since 2019 with, with a, except for the small upgrades we have done. So then we did the logistical and storage study and Stockholm is situated in the middle of Stockholm. So obviously it's not, it's not, diff, it's pretty difficult to, and there is no cluster in Stockholm. So they had to do all the whole uh, shipping and uh, the, the storage uh, discussion, we've been doing all that and we've been discussing with many different shipping companies and we know uh, a lot about ship CO2 shipping actually. But they, as they are one of the first ones and they are not, you may know there is not one single uh, large scale uh, ship yet. The first one will come out 2024, the first ships, but they are now uh, at least 14 projects of uh, developing CO2 ships in different uh, sizes. So we did the pre-feed um, 2020-21 
and now we are actually working as owners and owners engineers um and it's petrofac who's doing the who is doing the the feed and we are actually the owners engineer so we are checking all the heat and mass balances all everything that uh, petrofac is supplying so we are uh, on their backs um, and uh, checking everything but they will go live so they will have in the end of next year or middle of next year they will have financial close and they will start the project so it's very exciting to be there and to see everything from the very start to the very end and as you see it's a bex plant you can see up there to the right they're actually burning fuel so they are burning 4500 cubic meters of biomass every day uh, and uh, since it's biomass and they are storing biomass they get these negative emissions so they are actually they are actually vacuum cleaning the atmosphere from carbon uh, co2 molecules it's very exciting so uh, next slide please so i'll just explain very briefly what uh, post-combustion uh, carbon capture is so uh, actually uh, you can see a mines on the green spot there the a mines has trl9 potassium carbonate has trl9 cypem is actually a hot potassium carbonate with or is actually potassium carbonate with enzymes and then you have chilled ammonia uh, and though that's uh, trl8 chilled ammonia is trl7 and then we have sea capture a uk company very promising who are somewhere between trl6 and 7 uh, and uh, uh, so there are many technologies we are, which are close to having trl trl 8 to 9 which you may want to have before you start investing and you can say that by 2025 there will be more companies more technologies that will have trl 8 to 9 so basically all of these com com all of these um, technologies and some more technologies are you know you should look at but basically they work the same way so alan if you can show the with it with a with your cursor on the bottom left there where it says fg plan and intercooler that's actually incoming flue gas so the incoming flue gas gets in there and it's actually uh, compressed into there with a fan or a compressor and then the flue gas bubbles up through that uh, column so the bubbles goes up and those uh, stretch thing there are actually something called packing so basically it's an increase of the surface area so the, the bubbles goes up into this packing and when each bubble has reached the top 90 percent of the co2 it has actually reacted with the flue with the with the uh, liquid which is in that column so if it was like 15 percent co2 in the bubbles in the beginning it's only 1.5 percent in the bubbles in the top in the meantime it the the co2 has reacted with a with a liquid which is in that uh, column and the liquid comes from that blue uh, blue arrow to the right of the first where it says cool three the liquid comes in on the top 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 there it comes in the liquid comes in there and it pumps downwards so the liquid pumps downwards and actually reacts with the co2 and then it goes into the rich pump there on the bottom and goes through the heat exchanger up to the top of the other uh, of the top of the of the desorber which is to the right and there actually uh, the liquid pumps down into that uh, particular desorber and on this left to the to the right there you says reboiler the reboiler actually introduces steam into the steam into the desorber and actually we boils out we actually boils out the co2 so you increase the temperature and and the co2 actually evaporates out from cool on the top to the right cool six so the co2 comes out there and that's how it works all the technologies work the same way fairly simple actually and this technology has been working like that for fifth no 70 years it was actually developed in the 50s uh, for when you were cleaning gas that came up from the ground 
The, the natural gas came up from the ground. They wanted to clean it from CO2 and H2S, and they needed to have this system to clean it because you couldn't sell natural gas with uh, these components. So actually, you, this, has, this is a very mature process been going on. There are thousands of plants like this. The new thing is that we're going to use a flue gas. And the flue gas contains two things that natural gas does not contain, and that's oxygen and NOx and SOx. So basically, because of the SOx and the NOx and the oxygen in the flue gas, it complicates things. Because actually, uh, these other components also react with some of the, of the liquids and creates problems. So that's why you need to look at these studies. All right, so uh, I hope that was fairly clear. So let's take the next, uh, the next slide. So what we do is we check, uh, we do the studies and we do the, the integration of the heat and mass balance and all things. And we get this kind of look at the different technologies and you see, well, this is how they, they perform in your plant. And we look at different variables, flue gas volume, properties, CO2, percentage, NOx and, ox and, and O2, cost of power, cost of steam, footprint available, distance to harbor, distance to rail, distance to storage, what kind of uh, weighted average cost of ca capital you have in your plant and the lifetime you want to have. And then you, we end up with like a um, very a detailed report, typically 50 pages of compressed information about how to implement CO2 uh, CCS on your plant. All right, next slide, please. So, uh, I think we actually, uh, this is kind of uh, what we do then. It's a screening study, transport and storage study, then the concept of the site, and then the feasibility where we look at both cost and income. So I think we discussed that already. And of course, ABB will be very involved with this. So ABB will actually be the, 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 the company that actually interact with you. We will support ABB in these studies. So we will be in meetings. We will be there. ABB will talk to you, make sure that you're happy with the information. We will interact with information. You have to tell us about your plant. You have to tell us about the flue gas and all that stuff. ABB will be instrumental in, in communicating with you to actually make sure that we get all the information and, and, and we discuss with you in a relevant way with the right people on your side. And both ABB and we are 100% independent technology-wise. So we will not go to one technology provider and say, this is what you're going to do. We're going to look at this from a total independent perspective. And I think I can tell you it's really, really important. If you go down the wrong route, it will cost you 30 to 100% more than it should. All right, uh, next slide, please. So basically, as I said, you're responsible for the molecules all the way to, uh, to the end. And I see that we are actually uh, lacking a little bit of, of, uh, of our time here. So let's go to the next slide. So CCU is basically the same thing, but instead of carbon, instead of storing the CS, CCS, you actually combine it with nitri with hydrogen and you, com you make fuel. And it's almost as complex in terms of, of, almost as complex in terms of logistics as it is with CCS. And I will not, I will leave this slide. I can tell you a lot about this, but we have a little bit of time. Uh, so if you take the next slide. So we can also put up this uh, demonstration unit, which I think is very important to do between a pre-feasibility study or a feasibility study before you take financial investment decision to see the technology that you actually developed, uh, you would like to test that on your plant. So we put up this one ton per day demonstration plant uh, on your site. We drive it there and we test it for six to 24 months and make sure that your flue gas actually works well with the technology. I think that's really good to seeing is believing and your management and your uh, owners will be very happy to have that done. 
So if you take the next slide, uh, I think uh, basically your is all yours, Alan. Okay, all right, thanks, Martin. So we'll we'll do poll question number three. So have you completed a feasibility study on CCS technologies that can be applied to your facility? So um so there's there's five options again. Yes, and we have a net zero roadmap. So you've done the, the feasibility study and you've got a roadmap to take you up to net zero. 2040 2050 wherever your strategy is yes but we we have yet to uh, to cost net zero so you've done a feasibility but you you it lacks the costings in there you've got a option three is a feasibility study will be carried out either back end of this year next year no there are no existing plans option d for a feasibility study um number a is there is insufficient understanding of ccs in your business organization so again it's over 30 seconds if you can answer one of these and we'll share the results with, uh, as it comes out one thing martin did say and um, during this was not to tie yourself with a technology provider early on and um, you know i think that's crucial because as soon as you're tied in it's very very hard to get out of an nda and it's very hard then to, for you to because you, you you acquire a certain knowledge, very hard for you then to go a different route with that knowledge. And that's where the real cost changes is. Um, so looking at the answers to that, only 11% of you have done a feasibility and have a roadmap. Another 15% have done a feasibility, but have yet to cost net zero in there. So 25% in total have done a feasibility of one sort or another. Another 26% They've got a feasibility in your strategy for the next 18 months. But the vast majority, 37%, say there are no existing uh, plans for doing a feasibility study. And fortunately, only 11% say there's an insufficient understanding of CCS in the organization. So there is an understanding, but you know, half of organizations don't have plans at the moment for net zero in uh, either doing a feasibility study or have done one so far. So again, extremely intriguing so um that was the that was the last of the presentation from captimize so um i'll have a look at what questions we've got in there so the first question uh was around the feedback to poll one um yeah, we made those questions as a single answer only. Um, one of the organizations are actually doing looking at energy efficiency as well as doing fuel switching at the same time. So maybe we should have been, a, been doing that as a multiple answer in there. Second question across to you, Martin, is with reference to marine carbon capture and storage, at what point would the responsibility for carbon capture, uh, carbon ca uh, captured carbon end? I would assume when a captured carbon is transferred to the CCS shore facility, responsibility for the permanent storage and ensuing leak should lie with the CCS facility and not the ship. Who, who, who takes responsibility for the molecules as you described it? Well, actually it is, uh, of course you have, it's like a transport. You transfer, you, you know, you buy transport of, of your goods uh, to somewhere and they of course are responsible that the goods will actually end up in a place, but you're actually responsible uh, for, for having a contract with this transporter and if you, especially if you work in the, in the negative emissions area, if you're a waste energy plant, uh, assuming that you have 50% uh, fossil and 50% biomass, for those biomass uh, part, part uh, molecules, you have to be able to show if it is uh, Microsoft that's going to buy your uh, negative emissions, they want to be sure that your molecules are actually stored. So you have to be sure you have to have an agreement for the whole chain and you have to be able to know when your molecules are stored. So there is a contractual issue that you have to be very careful with, with your transporter, with a cluster, how are you going to you know, formulate that particular uh, responsibility. And we've been discussing this with many storage sites and, and there's, it's not without friction actually. So it's come something that's going to be will be developed, I think, the next few years. Okay. And the guy who posed the question, uh, if you want to send an email to, I've, I've put the contact details on the screen now for but either myself or Martin, uh, please please do so in there. Um, another question, 
Um, is the captimized demo demonstration unit you talked about, Martin, is that fully technology independent? Yeah, right. Uh, it is fully technology independent. However, uh, there are a number of components that we need to exchange from uh, one technology, one capture technology, or one uh, solvent technology to the other. So we have it's like a Lego uh, kind of uh, thing. So you have to decide, like uh, when you order it, you want to uh, you want to test if you want to test amines, so you want to test hot potassium carbonate or C capture or whatever. You have to tell that in in between. We can't just change on the fly. It has to be decided uh, beforehand. Okay, and uh, the second part of that question. Um, how many different solvents can it, can you run through the demonstration unit? How well, many different we can, we can, yeah, we can run uh, we can run uh, hot potassium carbonate. We can run a mines, and in the a mines there are at least ten different uh, type of solvents, and uh, we can run BASF, and we can run the Mitsubishi, and we can run uh, basically any. Of, of those, if they if if Shell will give a leave us the the solvent, we will be able to to run it. So and we will be able to run C capture solvent. So I think that um, there is no real limitation, on, you know, provided that it's the the say it is you know the absorber and the desorber kind of technology. So cryogenic uh, capture we cannot do. Okay, uh, next question, Martin, and it, this will be an interesting one. See if you can answer it. Is it possible to capture too much CO2 and cause a problem to the atmosphere? No. Okay, that, that was an easy one. And uh, do you have a plan for developing nations who are yet to explore oil and gas? And for developing nations? Yeah, I, I mean, that's no. Oh, for developing nations. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but this is kind of a, I, I think that, you know, we are, we, we just had a, I don't know what the developing nations in your, the criteria, but we had a talk with, with, um, uh, with Brazil uh, just two weeks ago with a big, uh, a big pulp and paper plant in Brazil who wants to create negative emissions. Uh, that was very, it was, it's one of the largest plants in the world. And so, uh, but of course, um, we need to go. I mean, you know, it's 20,000 plants out there that need to capture uh, CO2. It's I also think, Martin, got looking forward in the future, you know, if you think of the lot of gas exploration that will go on, I think in the future, and we're probably five, ten years away from now, those projects will only happen with CCS built into those gas, and a lot of the gas will be used to generate hydrogen or to produce hydrogen, is blue, hyd uh, blue hydrogen and so on. So, you know, I think that's where we'll see developing nations go. Either they do it themselves or they ship the gas and and they'll be utilized for blue hydrogen, which itself then would have a carbon capture scheme built into it. Yeah. And I, I you know, what you see is a shift also from investors. The investors are actually going into projects. I just heard a, a waste energy plant who actually said that, you know, a half a year ago, they just wanted to look at, you know, what technology of, of you know, which bubbling bed or whatever I was going to use, but now they require me to put up a carbon capture. Otherwise they don't want, they don't want to invest in the, in the, in the waste energy plant. So, I mean, investors are actually very active in this field now, right now. Okay. A few more questions. Is much learning being taken from the waste industry on duty of care? Um, Sorry, it just slipped uh, on duty of care to support CO2 storage responsibility. Uh, you mean, uh, well, I think everybody's learning from everyone right now and we are scrambling to to speed up uh, to speed up that. But but uh, we are uh, if I, I, you know, what I can say is that when you start looking at CO2 capture on a waste to energy plant, you start understanding that it's much better to to reduce the fossil part. So you, it will actually drive you to start reducing the fossil part of the of the of the waste. 
So we can see that as a driver. I don't know if that was the answer of the question. Yeah. I, and I, just, to, just to add to that, Martin, you, uh, I shared right at the start the project ABB is involved, which is building the CCS uh, um, sort of infrastructure. And these infrastructure projects are all in feed at the moment. In the UK, they're all in feed anyway. And they're hugely expensive. So there's a lot of thought, a lot of the going into those projects. And I think... A lot of those will progress, but you know, CCU will will become more prominent as well as we go because th there is a something around long term duty of care around the storage of see uh, the carbon dioxide as well. And if we if we can utilize it, we can recycle it. That will that will be uh, better in the long term. But you yes. know, this is a big big chance for for industry and for society to start off with. And you know, at the moment we need to make some of these projects go past feed into implementation because that's how we'll learn as well. Yeah, and CCU, you can say that, you know, we've been studying CCU quite extensively. And when you talk about CCU, you're talking about two things. You're talking about airplane fuel and ship's fuel. That's mm -hmm. kind of 90% of what you're talking about. Then you have some mineralization, you have some chemical stuff as well, and some greenhouses. But but the majority of the projects will be ship's fuels uh, and airplane fuels. Okay. Uh, next question. So back to the easier questions. What's the approximate inventory uh, quantity of solvents in the uh, capitalized demonstration unit? Oh, the actual quantity. Well, uh, <laughs> I should know that. I don't know that exactly, but maybe it's a. Uh, maybe it's. Um... What we'll do. Uh, what we'll do. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll go back to. We'll go. We'll answer that question outside outside this thing. I think, and we, uh, you know, um, and we'll be able to share. The inventory of solvent staff inside the unit. Yeah. Okay. Um, DAC versus point source capture would cost be the comparable for a fur, third of a kind projects of similar scale as tech evolves, as technology evolves. Oh, I I mean you know. 400 ppm. You you you. We are you know we are comparing uh, catching. Uh, catching elephants or catching mosquitoes that's kind of the the scale uh, i mean it's uh, you're, duck direct air capture it's 400 ppm in the atmosphere and in the flue gas it's between 10 and 20 percent so it's like a, a big difference it's much cheaper to much less expensive to capture from a flue gas much more much less expensive yeah okay and the last that last question I'll answer is this webinar recorded? Can they access the recording? Yes, everyone on this webinar uh, will get a, a thank you email for attending. There'll be a short survey at the end, but you also will be sent within a few days uh, a link to the recording of this webinar. So that's why we record it so people can actually then uh, revisit the webinar. Okay, I think that's all the questions, Martin. So with that, I'd, I'd like to thank Martin. It was a really excellent. Uh, webinar so um it's hugely enlightening you know we're bringing in 15 years 20 years experience of ccs into here we're able to share this i'd love to be able to see um one of those carbon capture units uh demonstration units in action so if, if one of the p uh, one of the audience on here are interested in demonstration the unit we'd love to make it uh bring that into the uk market as demonstration unit it's the most visited container as you heard from martin so it'd be great to have one one in there and we may get it to pay for itself if we can charge an access fee for people to come and visit it as well i okay. can tell you we are we are just now installing a plant in a waste energy and uh, waste energy incinerator in the south of sweden uh, this week we are doing uh, site acceptance testing and next week on monday we have the biggest power producer in india coming to see that uh, to see that plant yeah so and everybody is interested in this so it's yeah. not uh, it's not yeah. uh, i and martin it's a very low cost way for people for emitters to show they want to be in car you know a lot we talk about a lot of the projects are in feed at the moment and you know these projects have a very long uh, uh, life before they'll be in full production this is a very easy way to, to reduce the risk of the projects it's a low cost option to bring in a carbon capture and demonstrate to your stakeholders, to your investors that you want to be as part of the, the carbon capture and to learn from it as well.
and hopefully have the most visitor container in the UK or wherever you are in the world as well. Okay, okay, with that, Martin, thanks very much. So, you, Martin's details are on the screen. There's uh, one more question um, that's just come in. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes, it is actually uh, possible. Everything is possible, but it's it's actually quite expensive to capture CO2 on a, on a car because it's uh, it's a very small unit and you have to kind of take out there, but it's not impossible. So, and, and they are talking about it on ships, on ships engines, uh, which is bigger, of course. So big is beautiful in this, in this area. So, uh, but it's not impossible. Okay. All right. With that response, I'll close this webinar. Thank you. Thank you everyone for uh, taking your lunchtime uh, to listen into this webinar. We'll send out the link with, in there and uh, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the day and the rest of their week. Okay, thanks everyone. And thanks Martin uh, for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you.